How much is the church worth? I'm not talking about a dollar and cent value. Not speaking of the value that we might place on the property, on the bricks and mortar. Not speaking about the available funds on hand or even the culmination of the talent that's assembled in the room. Let's move beyond that sort of thinking. The church is not any of those things anyways. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the fleshing out of Jesus in the world. The church is the vessel of the Holy Spirit by which we are empowered to work together towards the advancement of God's kingdom. How much is the church worth? How much is it worth to you? For many, the church is taken lightly. For many, the church appears to have little value whatsoever. For many, the church just isn't that important. Now, we might come to expect that for those who are outside and beyond the walls of the church who have never been affiliated with a congregation. But the church is often many of those things even for those whose names are on the roll and who attend on a fairly regular basis. For the Apostle Paul, the church had great value. Paul speaks of the value of the church to the people in Colossae in his letters. He says to them that he is willing to be a servant, a slave to the church. He says that he is and is willing to suffer for the church. He says that he is willing to labor and struggle with all of the energy that God has given him for the church. For Paul, the church was highly valued. And there is a reason why he considered it so valuable, because he said that the church was wrapped up in Jesus' love. In Ephesians 5.25, he writes, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, if the church is not the bricks and mortar, but is the people, then Paul is saying that Jesus loved you and gave himself for you. He loved the church. In Patterson Avenue Baptist Church, we have many who love and value the church. But for a few moments, I'm gonna pick on just a couple, Brian and Sue Sneed. Now, someone later today will have to tell Brian that I said nice things about him because he's not hearing anything that I'm saying. Brian and Sue have loved this church throughout all of their married life. They have invested their lives in this congregation. They have invested their family in this congregation. The church for them has always been worth their time and attention. Nobody has spent more time at the church than Brian Sneed. I, when I first became pastor, it seemed that every time I popped my head out of the office throughout the week, Brian was there. Repairing something, replacing something, moving something, directing something. Very little happens at the congregation's meeting house when Brian is not the center of it. If there is a classroom that will contain a Bible study group on Sunday, Brian is there to make sure on Friday that the lights are working. If there's going to be a dinner on a Wednesday night, Brian has typically been the one to be there to set up the tables. Or he has brought his sons and grandsons and made them set up the tables. Brian is the one who makes the tea that you drink when we gather on Wednesday night. 
When the seasons change, he makes sure that the heat is working in the winter and the air conditioner is working in the summer. But for Brian, it's not been about the building. It's about what happens in the building. What happens here? People gather to experience God as a family. The Bible says when two or three are gathered in his name, God is present despite our failures, despite our flaws. God is present by his grace to empower us. God is there. You can see that theologically in the scripture when you look at the terms that are used to describe the people of faith. They are called, we are called, the body of Christ. Now I take that to mean that we are the incarnation of Jesus' presence in the world just as he was the incarnation of the Father. We are the body of Christ. We are the people of God. We are a household, a family of faith, a communion of saints, the scripture says. The building is where the church gathers. It's where inspired scripture is read and taught and applied to life. It is where we gather for individual and corporate prayers. In just recent weeks, we had a participant in the life of this church experiencing grief who came not to talk with the pastor, not to talk with the secretary. He just asked if he could sit in the sanctuary for a few moments so he could pray. This building, this meeting house, is a place where God's work is launched into the world. Where we pray and bear one another's burdens and inspire and equip one another and study scripture together. So that when we go into our workplaces and our communities and our neighborhoods and our schools, we go as a witness to the Christ that we encounter when we gather in this place. Paul Menear wrote, wherever the church is spoken of, the power of the Holy Spirit is assumed to be at work within it. When we gather as the church in this place, or in our homes, or Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Hardy's, God is there. Whenever we gather together, and speak of Jesus. He is there meeting needs, strengthening us. We gather in this place for worship and fellowship and ministry and to engage in outreach and God is with us meeting our needs and strengthening us. The church meeting house is worthy of our time and attention because it is the location where we gather to meet God as a family and where God meets our needs as a family of faith. In this meeting house, Brian has always been behind the scenes to make it happen. And when you get here, you'll probably find Sue also. She's usually early. early. When she sets out, you think she might be late, but Brian was driving, so they get here real quick. I've told people on many occasions that Brian is my evangelistic technique. When nothing else works, I give people a ride with Brian. It scares the hell out of anyone. <laughs> She's early. She's of help in the kitchen. We have sat and made mashed potatoes out of a box more than most people do in a lifetime on Wednesday nights. And Sue is always there with a smile on her face and a positive attitude, loving the people who are in this place. The church is worth time and attention. The church is also worth energy and effort. There's a story about a fishing village that was near a turbulent river. There was a young boy who fell into the river and he was caught up in the rapids and a strong young man volunteered to rescue. He tied the rope around his waist, tossed the rope to the crowd and he jumped in. He fought the rapids, he grabs the boy, he pulled on the boy and then he screamed to the crowd, pull us in, pull on the rope. And the villagers looked around. Nobody had grabbed hold of the rope. In their incitement, they had watched everything that was happening, but they didn't hold the rope. 
For me, Brian Sneed has always held the rope. We have spent countless hours sitting and talking. Sometimes suggestions were given to me. Sometimes Brian accepted a little bit of counsel and advice from me as his pastor. Sometimes it was simply for prayer and encouragement. And sometimes it was just to tell a joke or a story that usually began like this. Did you hear what Gerald Dudley said? For me, Brian has always been holding the rope. He has been that way for many of you. Sue has been that way for many of you. You've been that way for one another. Don't neglect that gift of encouragement. Each of us have a calling to be that kind of person to someone. Who is it that you are called to encourage? Paul wrote, I labor, struggling with all the energy that God has given me. That's the kind of passion that we see in Brian and Sue. The church is worth our time and attention. The church is worth our energy and effort. The church is worth our joyfulness. The happiest people in the world are those who are committed to a worthwhile cause. That's why Brian and Sue have such a successful marriage. They've been committed to the worthwhile cause of loving each other, of raising their children to know and love Jesus, and of encouraging and strengthening this congregation. And they do it with such joy. Even when Brian Sneed is on a terror rampage fussing about something, he still does it with a laugh. The two of them have a great sense of humor. They are happy even in the midst of tough times. They laugh often, they tell jokes often. They have the best family stories ever. When Brian called to tell me about his illness and the chemotherapy, I told him not to worry that that would not be what take his life. He said, oh yeah, why not? And I said, because you're going to irritate somebody in a parking lot and they're going to kill you. <laughs> they are always joyful. There's always a laugh. Because they've in divested, invested themselves in a great cause. They want to see the kingdom of God advanced from this place. They want to see the gospel proclaimed. They want people to come and know Christ. Brian and Sue are two of the best people I have known in my 25 plus years as a pastor. They're examples to me and to all of us. And so in examining an example, there's an encouragement for you and I. You and I are called to devote our time and attention to this place and the people who meet here to be supportive and encouraging, to be an example and to send them out into the world as we go, as witnesses. We are called to give our energy and effort to the mission and ministries of this church that we've engaged in over the years and still have other things to do. And we are called to be people of infectious joy. No matter what the circumstances may be, there is a confidence and a joy that is ours because we walk with Christ. We are encouraged to be that kind of people. People of joy and laughter. Brian and Sue, I thank God for both of you on the occasion of your anniversary and we do as well as a church. We love you and thank you for the example that you give. And all of God's people said. Amen. Our 